welcome to this week's episode of Home Screen. Uh, today I had the pleasure of chatting to Tom Richardson from a London-based fintech called Lumio. Lumio are doing really cool things in and around the space of uh, analysing transaction data but also trying to build a, a more complete financial picture um, and make suggestions based off that of how you can grow your money. Um, today we're going to be taking a look at three separate components. Um, the first one is going to be a profile builder. So how you go about actually uh, filling in the gaps that maybe is missing from the current data sets. Second is the open banking integration using MoneyHub. Um, that provides um, AIS or account initiation service access to transaction data from things like uh, savings accounts, current accounts, investment products, and so on and so forth. Uh, and then finally, we're going to take a look at the, um, the way that the recommendation engine surfaces um, some suggested savings accounts in this instance. Um, so all of those things could be brought together in this week's episode um, and it's a great conversation. So how did you kind of get involved with Lumio and, um, and what were you kind of doing in the run-up to this. You just kind of alluded to the fact that you've kind of, um, like every single person I've spoken to, segued into product from some other part of the world. Um, but how did that happen? Yeah, so going way back, um, when I left like university, I actually was an investment manager for seven, eight years. So I've definitely got one foot in sort of financial services and sort of, sort of investment advice area. Yeah. Um, but I sort of slowly realized over time it probably wasn't something I was very passionate about. Mm -hmm. And I was actually quite interested in like products in generally emerging um, at that time. So this is going back like three years now. Mm -hmm. um, so I've got definitely a, a one foot in like the problem we're trying to solve and where Lumio's the space is in, but also hopefully with the product side of stuff building out. So after doing some time in investment management for a company for like yeah, seven years, mm -hmm. I moved over and did actually a start with a GA course, General Assembly course in UI UX design, which was an intense course, which was fantastic. Um, and then from that point, I worked with a product agency for about a year, uh, which was fantastic. Really got a feel for things, actually how things work, interacting with dev teams. And also really learning about speaking to the customer and how important that is. Um, so that sort of was my background. And then during that time as an investment manager, both myself and my brother actually, he's the other co-founder, yeah. he was an investment manager as well. Um, we kept getting told by our friends that like they didn't know what to do with their money. Um, and suddenly you sort of an itch becomes a scratch and you start sort of digging a bit deeper um, about what is that problem. And the problem is sort of where we are now with Lumio and that's what we're trying to solve. So we felt there was a massive gap in the market about how uh, some sort of millennials, let's say, for it's not the greatest word, but yeah, for millennials, mm -hmm. how they actually manage their money and how they sort of optimize their money. So um, that's where it all started about a couple of years ago. And then we yeah, started building out Lumio. Um, but the original, take it back, even a step before, before jumping into what Lumio was going to be, we started a newsletter actually. Um, it was called Lumio Spotlight. Um, not sure if that's something you've yeah, come across mm. um, and it was a touch point to try and understand what people's problems are with money mm. so we did sort of a you know, fun take on the fi financial news and business news but it was a real touch point for us to actually ask, ask asking questions about how people manage their money why they don't optimize it why they stay you know, with why they have some ap sort of apathy to it and why they stay with the same old providers since they've been at uni with like a NatWest savings account or whatever, whatever it is and it was a Bit of a chance to dive a bit deeper into that, really. Yeah, I'm, I'm particularly interested in that as a as a notion, like the idea of um, like maybe other things that you can do on the side before you've built or rolled stuff out in order to kind of test the waters, engage the waters a bit. I think someone who's doing a really good job of that is, um, is I've seen you you guys will deconstruct different products on that show on that in that newsletter as well. Yeah, is that, right? is that the same product? Um, and then you'll talk about kind of specific. Uh, brands that are out there doing certain things and why they're yeah. good at that and so on. Um, and there's another company called Nude that are doing a, a, a variation of that. It's quite, a, yeah. um, I guess it's a bit new. Uh, maybe past six months or so they've been doing that and actually rolling out with insights from, you know, people from within the creative industries and that kind of stuff, which is um, really, really interesting as a go to market strategy. Like, how do you capture attention before you've actually put anyone onto a product? Um, 
but uh, was that the intention there with you guys was yeah. to build pre-hype and you know exactly i think you're bang on i think it's got a couple of different strands um so like one is definitely a go to market and so touch point to hopefully start at the top of that funnel for acquisition mm. there's also like we knew there was a problem and i like i can dive into the problem a bit a bit more detail yeah. like we knew there was a problem in the space but what was the problem and what were the actual pain points people customers were feeling so yeah. it's a great touch point so go to market yes but also and really getting to know like what the problem was it was a really easy in mm. um and just sharing start to share those insights and build up our own bank of data mm. before we start spending money on building x we really need to know what the problem was so we try to take it a couple of steps back and buy the some time at the same time open banking was emerging but it wasn't quite ready and it was still very much in the screen scraping days so um we didn't really feel like jumping into that end was the right thing to do so it bought us some time not to be too early into the market which i think going back five years you probably saw some players too early into this space because open banking apis weren't available or open finance as we looked to push them all so yeah, yeah. And um, you've you mentioned that like there is a technical element which maybe followed the like the discovery process or figuring out who your customers were and that kind of stuff. How does the tech side work for you guys? You see, you, you sort of like a product sort of user experience kind of person yourself. Yeah. Um, how do you get the thing built and and, and <coughs> who looks after that for you? Yeah. So it's myself who runs the product, um, and then below, then the other two founders just share out a bit more of the team. Uh, Charlie and Adrian. Charlie is sort of the marketing CEO um, and Adrian runs sort of the ops side of things as more a CEO, I suppose. Um, and then we have a dev team of three led by Max. Um, so that's how the product's built out. And on top of that, we work with uh, TSB, where I provide a money hub for our APIs. So we part of an agent model really on that. Okay, cool. And um, so, a little bit more digging into the problem space. What, what did you find out from this newsletter? Who are your customers, and um, and kind of why uh, why was this the right time to solve that problem? Yeah. So as I mentioned, like my background was in sort of investment management, financial services, and then moving into product. But we really saw that there was a an accessibility or financial advice and guidance for so many young people. So you saw if you throw back to RDR and all the gaps that fell in that. So and people fell between the gaps. Mm -hmm. Then you saw an emergence of more and more B2C fintech propositions, especially on the back of open banking, but you know, the likes of Nutmeg, Money Farm, whoever it may be, Free Trade, which are really, really great solutions. But what we felt, and the, the difference in each product is nuanced, and there is a different way, and it's all faster and better, but we felt there was a gap after doing the research, which was no one's actually optimizing people's money from an independent standpoint, mm -hmm. uh, and that best interest standpoint. So. And that's given the rise to what we call you know, lazy money, where there are you know, billions of pounds just sat in savings accounts which aren't doing anything or an investment account which isn't returning the best. Um, so what we really want to be is sort of standard bearers for an independent marketplace in that way. We're really finding the best solution for a customer at that point in every point of their life going forward in their financial life. So um, those, those are the lots of things came out of it uh, from our research, you know, lack of education, et cetera, et cetera. But it's the the next step really about how do you get people optimizing that money from an independent standpoint and that's where we really really it's one of my pillars to be honest okay and did you see anyone trying to attempt to do a similar thing in the market at the minute uh, yeah i think in our early days i might be wrong and correct me like the likes of buds definitely trying to build up a marketplace and yeah. then they sort of moved away from a b2c proposition as a of a provider yeah um which also makes you think, oh God, it must be very hard to build. And it is hard to build, but we think we, we started a bit more narrow and thin. But in terms of our wider and sort of space in the competitors, we try to differentiate mainly on that total independence and that sort of breadth of accounts that we're, we're covering, you know, from investments, pensions, savings, currents, mm -hmm. credit cards, and even loans coming online soon. So the likes of Yolt, Plum mm -hmm. and Oval Money definitely operate in our space, but mm -hmm. we're really passionate about that independence and not pushing into our own funds, which is absolutely fine. That's the company's business model. But if we feel the best provider for a, a user is the whole breadth of the market, we can actually pinpoint those providers. So like Lumio as an independent app, um, yeah, we just find the best fin FinTech or financial products for users to grow their money you know, in the right place at the right time. So that's really our, our core element. Um, and they do that by sort of connecting their accounts, 
we then do some analysis of their accounts and find ways to grow their money heavily and quickly. Got you. And uh, you mentioned just off the bat there that there's a um, a kind of a technical team led by Max, and then there's yeah. the marketing component and and um, and also an operational uh, side of it as well. How um, is that? How you like to um, think about product? Is that sort of like you looking after the product solely, and then you look after this team of developers? Um, and if so, did you kind of think about any particular methods of doing things when you were starting to build? Did you lean on anything? Being yeah, so I took sort of most of my lessons from uh, where I worked previously at Vitamin London, a design oh, okay. industry. Um, we do work fully agile and we are, not just to throw uh, words, but we are trying to be as cross-functional as possible. Like we had twice weekly user feedback sessions with the whole team, like from dev to uh, marketing to our SEO guy, like all in, so we really are pulling in that information all as one team. Like I mentioned, we're a pretty lean uh, startup, so yeah. everyone sort of hands in. Um, but it was really, really important to us is that, that open and like product uh, feedback loop for the whole team to make sure everyone knows where we're pulling and really important more than anything, know what customers are telling telling us, what, what what's missing, what they love, what they hate. It, it's all really matters. So as a team, we are super agile um, as because we can be at this point in time, which is one of the benefits of it. And a big part of kind of the, well, it seems to me there's two sides of your offering, which are in the first hand. One is the ability to connect an account and uh, to figure out kind of the position based on that, uh, that series of account connections. And the other is a more personal kind of uh, look or uh, profile building exercise, which you'll go through. Yeah. Um, so I'd like to, if possible, start with the profile element of that and then figure out what's going on there. And then after that, move on to the connecting journey. Right, so on this particular example, there's a personal kind of approach here where we've got an ethical component, a an, an appetite for digital, and then what the, and then the kind of another option as to what we kind of method of communication we prefer, I guess. Um, and that's a very thin kind of very limited number of questions that were just asked there and you've presumably picked out a profile or a persona based on that. Is that is that an accurate representation? Yeah, it is. Um, yeah, like you're 100% correct. We, and it, so the whole idea about trying to build a profile is for the now, for the customer, to try and give them some instant insight on their current financial stack and also some offerings that might be perfect for them in the future. Uh, yeah. so, so you're trying to build that. What is interesting is in a dream scenario, in the perfect world, we can glean most of this information from the data. And I think as we move to a world of open finance, from open banking, that is gonna become easier and easier for us to do. But in the early days, in order to be able to give that, that reward straight back to the customer, we start asking some very light touch questions. So one of the questions we touch on there is the idea of an eth ethical or not ethical. And this sort of plays the idea is that some, well, certainly millennials, price isn't always the most important um, driver or return. So yeah. for example, if someone wants to start investing or start saving for the first time or finding a savings account, a Triados account might be really perfect for that user because they're an ethical bank. And I think even recently we've seen Tandem move into something quite recently with an announcement yesterday. Yeah. So trying to get a build up a profile of the user is very quickly by asking some very light touch questions. In the future, it's something we're really really excited about as i'm sure millions of other people are that move to a more open data and open finance will actually allow us to glean most of that most of that information and go from what really is sort of a user-led input data collection to more of an assumptive based uh, world so we can confirm things with the user rather than asking the questions so with this is fantastic for this point in time but it also helps us a lot more in the future uh, when we start bringing other products and features into market yeah and i think that you can never like um i think you can't underestimate what you're kind of touching on there about like the maybe the quality of data or the um the ability of um, an early stage company to supplement that information with other kind of sourced information from the user themselves like um it's all well and good having a huge massive organization like amazon or whatever where you can literally yeah, run exactly. grips on, on millions and billions of people but the reality is is that you know everyone needs to kind of build a, a bigger picture and a profile of their users yeah. um i'm finding this a lot myself i'm doing a lot of data analytics work here at 11fs 
and if you um, and finding that you know the data is only as good as the kind of stuff that goes around it and um, and and building up that practice takes time so um, it's a an interesting um, an interesting problem to solve and uh, I think a good way in in the short term of, of getting kind of you know adding layers to your personas and things like that. Yeah um, I think you make a, sorry, a really good point there is like um, it's something we battle with like should we ask these questions of the user or are they do they think we should know this straight away from the data if they're willing to share the data. Yeah. It's something we played around with and tested and spoke to our, our user base for a long time about. Yeah. At the end we can give more value back to them if we ask a question that took you know, a couple of seconds to do that. And we can start building okay. profiles and personalities. Mm -hmm. um, it helps now, like I said, but it will also help big time in the future with as yeah. other features come online. And from an ethical perspective, it's a really good one to pick up as well because um, like with that question in particular, we had um, we had the head of product on from Bunk, um, nice. a, guy called, a guy called Michael uh, Brackpool, who, um, who's just released the new sort of a, a new feature called super green which is baked into their entire product experience where you know um spend up to a certain amount and then there'll be a certain amount traded off to um a a tree planting company somewhere so like you can see now that a lot of companies are moving towards that as a as a way of um as a way of attracting like this that audience that you know is not so concerned about the bottom line of a savings rate or as much as maybe a different type of user but um, but does like to kind of virtue signal in that way and show off that they are doing good or maybe, you know, um, maybe feel as though there's a little bit of, of their kind of uh, financial life which is doing doing good. Exactly. Uh, it seems think, like an important trade-off. Yeah, I, I think, like, as you it's also not the most important factor always just return for, for people. And that's like one of the big pieces of learnings that we had is like, like perception of a provider um, ethically as we ask or peer review are also like all things that are important mm. um, if you just want to go and return people will just go to a comparison website and yes. just and go for it but we want to use the data we have alongside yeah other elements to try and build that perfect profile yeah yeah and um, and so like on the on a little bit of information there about like profile questions versus like the open banking data you've mentioned there that there's a um, you've struggled with the kind of like the balance between how much to ask and how much to kind of um, glean. How did you strike the right balance in the first place? And um, and what does the what kind of well? I guess I can I can push this question to later on down the line. But um, in terms of how much information you can currently get from that open banking data, um, how how much was important to supplement? You know, with with that. Yeah. Personal? So I think. There's like the here and then where we're going. It's like, I know I keep mentioning it, but it's what we have now and how easily we can interpret that data and the consistency of it. Um, and also we are a smaller team at this point in time. Mm. Um, so we want to try and gather as many touch points as we can um, mm. without asking the, asking the user the question. So mm. as, as, as we migrate towards an open finance world, and you know, we're at the start of open banking. Open banking wasn't going to be a success overnight, but I think it's, you know, in 10, 15 years time, when we, still, we really see some incredible propositions, mm -hmm. that's when we start really leveraging the data during that, during that journey. Yeah. Um, so open banking itself and the data itself isn't a feature. It's, it is a platform to build great products on top of and great user experiences and great like, outcomes. Um, and so it's using that like, sort of base layer and that data that we can try and glean from to try and build and give more personalized insights to our users. So, so like to round back, and it's a bit of a rounded answer, but to come back to your question really, like it was a big battle like internally of how some parts of the team really, really wanted to ask more and more and more questions. Um, yeah. Others wanted not to. Um, we've come to these questions as, as is a balance between what is important to, so we can give value straight back to the user at this point in time, yeah. and then in the coming future. Yeah. You'll see let this, these questions more go to an assumptive uh, based model where a user will be saying, it looks like you're ethically minded because you have a ethical portfolios with company X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. You have, um, you shop ethically, all these kind of questions. We can glean from both financial transactional data, but also from their investments as we move to open finance. So by understanding their investment profiles, if they don't invest in the likes of BP, etc., we yeah. can start really making quite cool assumptions and building very interesting profiles about the user mm. and trying to confirm details. And how does that work typically happen, uh, Lumia? Like, who's um, do you have a certain person who will 
do that job for you? Is it someone like yourself that does it? Or um, who, who spends the time sitting down and really digging through, kind of pushing together these, these data sets and these insights? Yeah, so it's myself and Max who really try and work through it as hard as possible. Yeah. And then we do bring in a external source every now and again just to help make sure we, the data is working as perfectly as we want. Cool. Um, we just try to d- dive as deep as we can into it ourselves um, and try to build not too many profiles to start with. I think we're working with five profiles at the moment and then we'll expand and use the data to bring in more profiles over time. At, the point, at this point, it's a fairly simple, simplistic model. Yeah, yeah. That's what works for us and our user base. Okay, and are you using any specific like tools in order to get like those insights? Do you use any platforms or anything of note which uh, which you found useful? I'm asking personally from my own. Yeah, so for like the user experience side of things, we we run on we use Mixpanel, which is yeah. fantastic for yeah. our user understanding yeah. user journeys, mm-hmm. and then matching that with other data to try and build big, bigger profiles and audience profiles. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a combination of of those two really that we really run most of our information off. Well, that's, good. that's good to hear. <laughs> oh. I'm using something similar. Um, yeah, so, <clears throat> and then there's also like a goal component as well, which I think is really interesting from that from that journey we just seen, which is um, um, you kind of want them to have some sort of end goal in sight, yeah. I guess. And that's uh, in what way is that kind of helpful for you? Yeah, it's probably got quite a few different strands. It's got our uh, so sort of products uh, head on, and then also like the user head. So. For the user, we know the data shows that user setting goals helps motivate and increase the chance of completion. So there's that element of it and the personalized element. So users are ri- literally knowing that they're working towards something and they've also invested something into Lumio where they feel that they're, they're a part of it. They've set a goal. They want to achieve that goal is with in Lumio. So it helps with engagement parts. And yeah. then there's also for us as, as we expand our product suite, if a user, for example, uh, I'll, I'll run through an example in a profile. If a user is looking, we know they've set a, their goal to go on holiday in a year's time and it's a short-term goal. Very unlikely that we will suggest, or we won't suggest investing into the stock market for one year time horizons. So it's those kind of data that matched up with sort of risk profiles that we can start making more assumptions of the kind of savings accounts or the kind of investments which would be appropriate to them. So once you have a goal and a time horizon and the amount they're looking to get to, you start working back from there. So if someone, for example, though, is a, a profile, we have someone looking to save uh, for a house in seven years time, investing in the stock market suddenly becomes a very viable tool. And you can use this, you know, we like nutmeg, you can use the annual average rate of return and start plotting that against their performance of where they might get to and the times they might get to. So this is all helping build out that profile for the user and helping them get closer to completing, you know, Good user outcomes really and what they want fair enough sounds good um so the other side of that information as we've just mentioned is the um is the actual open banking information yeah um we'll just check this journey out now right so a connections happening here um with monzo via money hub um uh, yeah. here providing the connection to monzo's uh, APIs and you can connect your accounts there, personal and joints, and then entering in the four digit PIN to verify straight back into Lumio. Um, very cool. And nice little sort of yeah. sprinkle of confetti to say yeah. thanks. <laughs> um, lovely. And now we can see both accounts in yeah. your overview. So um, a Another super quick journey, um, another kind of really quick experience. I guess very easy to do that via someone like Money Hub, who, you know, um, and we've talked endlessly with many people on here about, you know, letting the, the really established smart companies help you scale in a way which is, um, you know, we've seen, especially, I, I, I guess, recently, companies like Galileo have like an instant product which allows card, um, card issuance and things like that. but. They're gearing themselves towards smaller to mid-level companies now rather than large companies. Yeah. Because there's an understanding that eventually you bring all that stuff in-house um, yourself. But for great, for, for early stage companies, it's great to just be able to tap into those sources. Why um, why Money Hub for this particular instance of um, of what you're trying to do there compared to you know other established players like TrueLayer and uh, OpenWorks and so on? Yeah, so obviously we looked at all of them at the time um, and Money Hub's 
have obviously been in the market for a long, long time. I think they predate open banking by you know, like five years and they actually had a B2C proposition. Um, what we loved so much is actually at the time they had a B2C proposition that we could all test uh, mm. versus some others out there where we could check the connections, check the speed. It does come down to our implementation and our, dev, in our, in our own execution of that. Uh, yeah. But we love that plus the breadth of accounts they have. Um, so because they still do do a bit of screen scraping and what's the research we found going right back to the start is the importance of having your full financial life. For us, just current accounts and savings isn't enough for for our users or credit cards as now comes into open banking, but yeah. actually having that full suite. Now, we do realize a screen scraping or a direct access connection with the lights with for a pension provider isn't the, the world's most perfect user experience and I think everyone knows that but if it's a trade-off where a user can have their pension their investment account etc all in one place we felt it was something worth pursuing and Money Hub do so much work behind the scenes on normalizing that data and the pension data and they've been quite instrumental in that space uh, with some of their bigger cut Sort of bigger clients yeah so knowing that made, gave us a lot of confidence to work with money hub um and also their api quality and their uptime is pretty much you know, second to none um so it's probably they're probably not seen as much as the likes of true layer out there where most new, new people in our space come <laughs> online with or whoever it might be or tink um mm. but they've been yeah it's been an amazing service um for us yeah. um so far and yeah that's, that's, um, that's pretty, much, pretty much why yeah and um i guess the the thing about, I guess, the the true layer thing is probably that it's all kind of exclusively API based and yeah. uh, less uh, less of the screen scrapey type stuff. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's it's useful. You know, in in in, in a lot of cases, it it might not be as useful for you as you know what the other what the trade off might be. Um, so, can you did you? Um, I would imagine that the that Money Hub are still offering like open banking APIs in the same in that same way, yeah. And so you're mainly gathering account initiation services um, information there. So like to be able to trans um, analyze transaction data. Is that correct? Or? Yeah. So how we use them? Um, touch on a really good point. First of all, was they, we are API first every time. If there's if there's a connection, we'd always go API first. Yeah. However, if there is not the opportunity, we'll go down the sort of screen scraping route. Um, and we're using it for AI, AIS services. We're an agent of Money Hub, which gave us really quick to market access um, and lower cost. Um, so we're straight into the market. They also have PIS, which will hopefully be bring online fairly soon. So at the moment, though, what you see in the journey is count, count connections, see all your financial data in one in one place, yeah. um, and, and building on top of that. Um, yeah. Really and I guess um, one of the interesting things about this is. Um, in the UK, maybe we do fetishize kind of those um, those like open banking API connections and things like that. Probably because it's um, you know because of the regulations and stuff like that. But you know, the most valuable API provider in the world is Plaid, which is you exactly. know, doing a doing a lot of screen scraping. So um, there's not really um, I think it's maybe maybe uh, less of a dirty word than than we in the UK give it credit for. I think, it, yeah, it got a lot of bad press as open banking was being pushed because, and they were like, pushed to outlaw it, etc. And I think it's, it's just one of those things, it's, it's perceived differently here. Um, yeah. But I don't think it is a bad word. Um, what I would say is, alongside using Money Hub, we've been excellent. When there are something more niche or different use cases for investment products which aren't in their roadmap, we will, well, we can connect and we'll go directly as we're building out at the moment. Um, some other investment platforms as well and robo advisors. So we're doing a bit of a combination of both, um, but it's really led by user demand. If our users are desperate for a certain connection and it's not a money hub roadmap, we'll work directly with that provider to bring that online. Oh, interesting. Exciting. Okay. And um, and kind of do you um, do you envisage that changing like with, with regards to like the PIS stuff? Is that something you think you you would be in the market to use? And if so, how would you yeah, so I think PIS is really exciting. I think the way we look at it is, again, as open banking is an enabler, um, but AIS is a bit of a so what, and the data is like, all right, cool, what now? And mm -hmm. it's that proactive, actually value-add suggestions or guidance or advice is the next step and use how you use and leverage that data. And I think PIS, as we've seen the numbers, I think I saw a stat a month or two ago, which was like only 1% of all open banking API calls are actually the PIS. So it's a 
big area to really develop in. And I think we've seen more and more examples of it coming online now. Um, I actually think Plum do a fantastic job with their PIS uh, offering. Um, we, yeah, we're bringing it online really, really soon. Um, we're quite excited about it. And our use cases are going to be more around not just the transfers or transferring from, from you to another account or friend to a friend on your payee book, but more around the sweeping roundups space is a really, really exciting use case. When you're an independent um, company, you can sit there and make financial suggestions on the best account across the whole market. If we can start sweeping payments and making suggestions that actually start moving money at the end of each month because you have X left over from your, mm. from your salary, I think those are really, really ex exciting use cases yeah. rather than pushing it to your, a fund you're associated with, but actually anywhere in the market then we're going to see some really really cool use cases and i think that's what we're really really excited towards the end of this year about yeah it's a very compelling use case that I, um uh, and a really nice use of like that roundup sweep up sort of functionality yeah I, I, yeah i think that's the like transfers are great but yeah. actually enabling people to make that next step is what we're really really passionate about mm. and um we've seen in that particular journey you connected via monzo which is the uh you know, I guess they've had their successes from an API perspective. Yeah. How have you found connecting with others? Um, have there been any sort of downtime and, you know, open banking APIs have been notoriously shoddy over the past few years. So um, the, the people have been reporting mixed. Yeah. Returns. Um, I think so, yeah. Mo well, Mozo is quite e interesting actually, because they have switched their, OP their APIs over from emails or Magic Link to a more open banking standard. And it's been seamless and they are sort of the rock stars of it, if that makes sense, and the APIs. And it's always a great one to showcase because it's so consistent. Mm. Um, I actually think Revolut have done a great job as well. Their customer experience really shines through on the connections. Um, mm. The tricky ones, to be honest, was that move from PSD2 that time back in March. We found that was a really hard time. But if you look at particular providers at the moment in the API world, it's probably American Express. The mm -hmm. API is proving a bit tricky, um, especially if the user is connected previously or you authenticated previously. You have to go back into the app and pull out their previous connection and confirm our connection, where we found a few bugs and it's a bit of a painful learning. But yeah. those are, I think, working themselves out. But across the board, I've got to be honest, we've been, haven't seen too many huge problems. Um, it's more individual cases rather than um, wide sweeping issues. Yeah. One, for a customer, the biggest problem we actually found is um, in the consistency of the accounts return. So, for example, one that returns everything, it returns your savings pots, etc., which is fantastic. But you go to HSBC and you have an ISA with them, a savings ISA, that's not returned. And what a customer struggles to understand, and it comes down to communication, is why a Monzo account sends them all everything, but why, for example, HSBC only sends them their current account and not some of the savings accounts. Yeah. I think that's a communication piece that we're really working hard to try and resolve. And is that because they're different parts of the business? Yeah, it is, and also choice. Um, some providers just decided not to open them up because it wasn't part of the regulation. ISIS weren't a part of it, but they were but they were an optional choice for open banking to people to bring on, and they just haven't done it. And I think it's that for the customer is why, is our biggest like inbound question, is I've connected X account, but it's not showing my savings account or it's not showing, showing my ISA. And it's that piece which we find a bit of a struggle at the moment. Got you, got you. Um, and so the end result of maybe both a personal profile and a, a connected account mm -hmm. is, in this instance, going to be the, the uh, savings guidance. So yeah, once we've done a little um, kind of uh, tailored kind of response, we can then be asked questions about Monzo, and then um, we can sort of see the, the number of years that we might want to lock money away for. And then a list of different providers which might suit us based on, on that. All the more here, and you've surfaced all that information and then that can be taken out into Aldemore's page. Uh, and presumably you'd be able to generate some sort of, um, some sort of referral off the back of that, which will help you to kind of um, to justify kind of uh, having that on the platform. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Five years fixed rate accounts and yeah. And then 
a bit of information about where the uh, in what name that's going to be held. Yeah. Right. So you've surfaced there a few different options based on a few different bits of criteria there. Um, and how do you kind of uh, in what case or what's the decision decisioning going on in the background to determine what a good like in this instance savings account looks like for a person? Yeah, it's a really important question. Um, and like, what questions do we ask along that journey? Yeah. Um, what is important at this point, we're not giving financial advice. Yeah. We are trying to give guidance. So we display, display a panel of choices at the end based on the balances they have in the account. We take data from the return they're getting in the current, their savings account they have at the moment and how that money could be working harder. So we're not going to display a return which isn't better than the returns they have currently. So. If someone's getting 1.5% on a one year, believe it or not, they probably don't get that anymore. One, <laughs> and we're not going to show them a 1.3% uh, with Shawbrook Bank, for example. Got so you. we take some of the data we have, so their current savings rate, the amount they have, the goal, etc., to determine the panel of selection of choices. Mm -hmm. And then if they feel very ethically minded, we're going to show someone like Triados at the top of that list for them as well. So yeah. trying to use all those data points we have, plus the questions we've asked, to come up with a very curated final list. Um, and at the moment, we work with eight or nine sort of challenger banks <clears throat> to have that panel, which is something like 60 accounts in total, yeah. going from less than six month notice accounts to one year, two year, three year, five year, yeah. and easy access accounts as well. Okay. Um, yeah. I think something that's quite passionate, and again, the debate within the within Lumio was, should we show providers that don't haven't got a referral agreement with us? Or our affiliate, as you said, that's how then we get paid in affiliate. Yeah. We actually decided to go whole market as much as we could. And if some providers decided they didn't want to do a referral agreement with us, we actually would still put them onto the platform anyway. Because mm. if we are going to be an independent platform, that's got to be at the heart of what we do. So we have everyone on there. So I think, yeah. which is I really think, important to us. And I guess in that regard, there's also, there's also a lot of um, benefit from showing them you know customer data about how many people have arrived on their site from your app I, um yeah it's something that we've been we've been thinking about a lot um ourselves so it's a really interesting um idea so um do you um this with regard to the information that you're gathering there and that maybe in that introductory set of questions that lead up to the kind of um are those requirements from your own sort of decisioning or are they things that come from the savings account provider or are they kind of regulatory in tone? Yeah, it's a great question actually. And it's like a real fine balance. Um, again, that's, we are on the financial guidance side of things and savings accounts is where we started. It's a sort of lower hanging fruit, uh, yeah. if that makes sense, to try and get people optimizing their money quite quickly and finding a better savings account for them. It really comes down to first, obviously regulation, make sure we are doing the right thing, but it is really research. And speaking to customers about what they want to go through, what the questions they have in their head when they're making a choice about what savings account or again in the future, what investment product they're going to find. So regulation has a massive uh, part to play, but we are con you know, conscious that what's more important as well is that customer outcome and what questions do they go through when they're looking for a savings account. So we literally did hundreds of screen recordings of asking users to go on and find not Volumio, just go on to Google and find a savings account. We tracked the questions that they went for, the filters they went through, other you know, comparison websites, and these are the ones which are the most important in the decision making. So then when you pair that with open banking data and the questions we've asked previously, we're suddenly narrowing the field for them, but not making that final choice and letting the user um, you know, make that decision, which is what's based on what's important to them. Is it the peer review? Is it, is it is ethical? Is it the rate? Yeah. Is it whatever it might be, and just making sure that we're being sort of customer led on that. And um, in terms of like you said, you you've stressed there before that it's not financial advice; it's guidance. Yeah. Is that because there is a, a a kind of you have to have a certain kind of position to to not to offer financial advice? Is yeah, it's associated with that as well. Yeah, we're we're quite focused on trying to be fairly light touching the regulation in the right way. Yeah. Um, Adrian, our co-founder, was a lawyer in payments and fintech for 10 years. Um, so we're pretty, like, so he's, we're always making sure we're well on the right side of it. And we just want to be light touch. Over time, that proposition is more than likely to change as we, as we expand and we have the capacity to expand in that. But at the moment, savings accounts are very easy for us to give guidance on. And also much like a comparison, comparison site for investment products, we can start 
pulling it that those in over the coming months. So I think, yeah, to answer your question, we are very much on the guidance side and we will be for the foreseeable future. That mm -hmm. will change over time as we can build out more and more data and have the capacity to do it. Okay. And um, yeah. in, the, in the short term, in the short over time, um, 2020 is nearly, uh, we're, we're rattling in towards August now. Yeah. How does the rest of 2020 look to you? It must have been a bit of a blur so far. So, yeah. Uh, what's been happening? Yeah, it's been a bit of a blur and a sort of narrowing of our value proposition. Um, however, I think we've got some pretty, well, we have some awesome, exciting products coming down the line and just fall, falling off the back of the savings account journeys that we just went through. Mm -hmm. Something we're really passionate about building out is actually the completion of that journey. As you saw there with Aldermore, it went through to a splash page with them. We're actually working hard with some providers to bring on APIs to pre-fill some of that data mm -hmm. and really trying to get that customer experience even better. So pre-filling that data so users aren't having to go back, refill forms, etc. Mm -hmm. And that's something which not all providers have, but we are bringing online increasingly over the next couple of months, which will be great. Yeah. Um, and trying to yeah trying to get that user experience even slicker. Um, yeah. You know, touched on payments earlier and the in interesting use cases of uh, PIS and payments coming mm -hmm. on later this year. So roundup, sweeping, rule-based savings that we've seen in the market, which have been really really popular. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and increasing our marketplace offering. So invest. So that's investment platforms and robo advisors with really really great customer experiences where we are using not APIs just for getting data our way and sending our data back to them to pre-fill um, pre applications so that gets rolled out quicker and quicker. Mm, so yeah, that's, that's, those are the three big points. And then the last one is a, a super something we're really, really excited about is Android. So we've delayed our release of Android for a long time, but we are in the final stages of that. So we'll be rolling out Android to supplement our iOS app, which is awesome. Well, I look forward to that personally. <laughs> Good. Um, so, and then in the run-up to this, I guess maybe in the context of what's happened over the past few months, but um, you've obviously touched on the fact that you're pretty glad that you operated really, really kind of leanly. Um, but kind of what would, if you were starting this project off again or kicking it off from build stage right now, or is there anything you think you'd do differently? Um, it sounds yeah. like you've done it pretty well, to be fair, to start with. Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, a couple of things like, it sounds sort of three things really. If we start with open banking and the connections around that, was we were a bit assumptive about the smooth rollout of it and hoped and then built and had roadmaps built on that. So maybe being a bit more cautious on that and not being so reliant on open banking in the early stages mm. or something. However, it's very hard not to get excited about the opportunities that you can build on top of it. Yeah. Um, the other one's the value of content. Um, for us, we really want to be an independent source of content that gives that you know that trust in the market that we are completely independent. Mm. And we've started building out our, our Your Money site in the last couple of months where we do reviews of products versus, you know, it might be not Nutmeg versus Money Farm, it might be Free Trade versus Hargreaves Lansdowne. And that, trying to build that piece out a bit earlier would have been fantastic. But at the moment, it's building and giving fantastic traction in the top of our funnel and also really I wish we'd done that a bit earlier in, in hindsight. Um, but yeah, those those elements are sort of key key moments. And then one which I'll come back to is just speaking to your customers and the market <laughs> more and more. Um, it's very easy to go for like a week without speaking to someone or diving deeper, but that is probably the most invaluable thing we can do is as a company and getting all parts of the company to speak to them, whether it's our Sean who runs our SEO or whoever it might be actually involved in customer feedback loops and testing sessions. I think that's something we've learned really quickly is and, and try to get more and more into company culture. And it's harder as you grow, but it's some, something we want to try and get embedded as well. Perfect. Well, thank you very much for taking the time, Tom. No, it's an absolute pleasure. Love being on. Thanks for joining us on this week's episode of Homescreen. Um, Homescreen, as you may know, is brought to you by the team that brings you 11FS Pulse. Pulse is a uh, product analytics tool that we provide access to thousands of customer journey from around the world and we show you how they're built figure out all the great stuff um, that goes into making those great um, customer experiences so uh, head over to pulse.11fs.com to check out the landing page and see what we're about and uh, you can contact us pulse at 11fs.com to find out a little bit more from our sales representative uh, thanks for joining us and i'll see you next week